Okay. Live stream. Live stream. <laughs> we on the same thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what's this? <laughs> right. <laughs> Y'all so silly. That's what's up. So Ain't nothing wrong with it. All right. Hello, everybody. This is Tiffany with the private room. And tonight we are going to have a very open, honest conversation about being victims of domestic violence and then how it affects your relationships after. So coming out of an, a domestic violence relationship and getting out of there safely. And then you start to live as a survivor or at least you feel that you are, but then you get into another relationship and you are still trying to heal from that EV relationship. And then how that affects you when you are triggered by certain things in your current relationship. Mm -hmm. So um, we're gonna dig deep tonight. This is a special episode. You usually have us live on Monday night at eight, but it's a Thursday. So I felt that this was something that needed to be talked about um, for personal reasons, but also because I know that I have a couple of my queen sisters that have also been through the same kind of relationships and have also um, themselves been faced with, you know, um, trying to navigate new relationships after being in abusive relationships. And when your spouse has been abusive to you, but then you find yourself in those situations where you might be actually being abusive as well. And a lot of that, for me, that's because something, tr that's because the situation that I was in at the time was triggering for me from that, those, that past relationship. So I think that in order for everybody to really, really understand what it is that we're talking about tonight, um, I think it's important that we share our stories about that time in our lives when we were in a relationship that was considered domestic violence, that was abusive, and what that relationship was like. And then we're going to talk about that moment where we realized that we had some of those behaviors that we thought we were free of. Yeah. And I'm not going to speak for anyone else, but me and my lashing out was because of the things that my current was doing that was almost the same behaviors and the same actions yeah. as the person that I was in relationship with that was abusive to me. Yeah. Um, and having those triggers and then reacting, maybe to some, it might say, look at as it being a, an irrational reaction but it's all because of the trauma from the past and tending to go from zero to 100 because now you're in defense now. Yes. You're in defense mode and you're seeing those behaviors in your current relationship that you saw in that abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. And so you react a little bit differently when you've never experienced domestic violence before, when you've never been in an abusive relationship before. You react differently after those relationships. Absolutely. You see things differently. You don't trust as much as you do. You don't give all of your heart. Um, and then when you do, when you think that you found the one or you think that you're in love again or you think that you're in a, a healthy relationship, there might be something that that person does that makes you think about that person that you left. Um, so... I want us to share our stories about those, that past relationship, that one that I'm sure pops up in our heads every single time we think about domestic violence and we talk about domestic violence. We're gonna talk about that. And then we're gonna talk about um, how it affected the next relationship or whatever that relationship is that you realize that you had some things that you need to work on because you were still healing, obviously. Absolutely. And those triggers were still affecting you in a negative way. Mm -hmm. And 
you reacted in a way that some might think was abusive. Yeah. Um, and as advocates, all of us being advocates, the last thing we want is to, for anyone to ever say that you're being abusive. That's right. Because that makes you look like a hypocrite. And that makes you look as if, you know, how can you go out here and advocate when you're doing these things? So my experience was recent and it made me think about my sisters. Like I know Nicole and you've shared your story with me before. And then hearing um, Rose, Rose P. Hill's story recently. And it, to me, it said, you know what? I need to tell my story. We all need to share our stories so that we can help others understand that if you're never, I don't think you're ever fully healed from being in a domestic violence relationship, especially if it gets, if it's so traumatic that you're losing your kids or, or you're having to move, you have to, you're, you're having to leave the house in a fast because your life depends on it. If you've ever been in a relationship where you're constantly cheated on or constantly put down, constantly dealing with verbal, emotional abuse, constantly being hit, it's, you, you don't have, you don't have any more normal relationships after that, no matter what. And you never fully heal and you never fully trust, at least not for me. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'll ever fully heal to the point of fully trusting again i don't think i will mm. but i say that now that doesn't mean that yeah. that won't change that's right so um yeah we need to have this conversation yeah we really do so i'm gonna let um <laughs> my my two ladies introduce themselves um and tell us, you know, about, you know, what you do in the community, and then we'll circle back, circle back around and share our stories, and then we're going to have that that discussion about how we had those moments where we were like, wait a minute, your behavior is not your behavior is abusive too. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Miss Nicolian, introduce yourself. Okay, my name is Nicole Ann Jackson. Um, my organization is Humanity Without Colors, also MAD, Mothers Against Domestic Violence. Um, <sighs> I don't know where to start. I love my community. Um, and the reason why I named it Humanity Without Colors is because I'm, I'm tired of the division. Um, the division, if it could be based on color, religion, um, gender, I'm just tired of the division. And we all face similar situations um, or have went through some type of pain, verbal abuse, um, physical abuse. Um, we have all just experienced life, um, no matter what that looks like, we have some similarities. So I want to bring, pretty much bridge, uh, close the gap with the division and respect everyone, no matter what their walk of life is. So um, I love going into other organizations and I will speak to the janitors in, in high respect because um, that janitor too is a, a human being, you know, so um do you want um, do you want her to to introduce herself before yep. she speak on do you want me to just go ahead and speak on yeah let's go ahead and um, introduce finish introducing ourselves and then okay. we'll talk and share our stories um miss uh miss Rowe, introduce yourself okay so i'm yoranda phillips um aka ropey hill and I am the CEO of Stepping Stone Productions. And what we do, we are an artist development company. So basically anything that you need as an artist, we're there for you. Whether you need a makeup artist, you need a time, um, anything pretty much you need to move to your next level, vocal training, 
you know, we don't just do singing and rapping. We also have a couple of comedians as well. So it's like, whatever you need. If I don't have it, I know somebody that has it. So we'll get it done either way it go. But I started my company just because um, when I first started singing, writing music and doing things like that, I didn't know anything about it, like nothing. Um, so I know there's a lot of artists out there who are in the same situation as me and is expensive. And so I was like, I don't have money to do this and do that. And people think that you can just go in the studio and make a song in an hour and that you didn't came out with a hit. But true musicians know that it takes time for your craft to develop. So that's not true, but it becomes expensive. So I also said, well, hey, I got friends that I know they're in the industry and they're willing to help out other artists as well. And so the savings that I get, I pass them on to my clients. Um, I have friends that are willing to just help out and want to mentor and do things of that nature. So like I said, whatever you need, we got you. <sighs> nice, nice. And I know that you um, and I, ever since we met, we clicked. So we, we've been, we been close ever since, ever since we met. <laughs> yes. and it's, it is so funny because we met at the Vibe Showcase. You, you were like, hey, I want to be on the showcase. We, we hit it off that day and it's been a wrap. Yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And met a lot of great people, a lot of great yeah. people so far who are helping me, you know, mm -hmm. still, because I'm an artist too, and I don't got it all together, but, you know, with the help of my community and the people That's and right. resources that I have around me, I'm going to be a great artist as well, so. Yes, you are. Right. Yes, you are. You already are. <laughs> already an amazing artist. So. Thank you, baby. The world just <laughs> don't know what you yeah. <laughs> Yes, they do. <laughs> Look, they, yes, well, they, they, do. they didn't know, they know okay. that. Okay. Yes, yes, they do. <laughs> I received that. I received it. Yes, yes. Um, I appreciate y'all coming to share your story. Um, it's it's really um, important to me for um, me to have people, not just myself sharing my story, but to have other people that um, I know who have been through the same thing um, or even something differently. And just knowing that we have each other and that we are all willing to share our voice, I think is commendable and something that you you should the two of you should be really proud of because y'all have been sharing you I know Nicole and you've been sharing your story for years I know Ro you and I are working on you know you sharing your story more so um I'm just really thankful for you ladies <laughs> thank you for having me thank you yeah. Yeah. so for me um I have been in abusive relationships all my life period um, ever since, you know, starting with my dad up until my current relationship, I mean, my current marriage, I've had really abusive relationships after abusive relationships after abusive relationships. And I thought, I thought they were done. I really did. I thought that, um, I was at a good place, um, before I got married, I, I put the time in, I was, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> I was, um, single for eight years um, between my last abusive marriage to, you know, my current marriage. And um, I felt that I had become the woman that I wanted to be. And then I met my current husband um, and, you know, things went pretty quickly, but um, I went into it. I felt a hundred percent. I felt like I was the woman, I had done the work, the mental, the mental counseling, the, the therapy, you know, just trying to get myself back to a good place with myself, loving myself again, um, you know, and becoming a really strong woman, a strong woman, a strong mother. Um, that's when I started, you know, sharing my story in the community um, after getting out of that abusive relationship that I was in. Um, and I got into another marriage that ended up being abusive again. And it was emotional and mentally abusive. Um, and I learned, you know, through research and my own experiences and the kind of things that I felt in my current relationship. So even though that, even though he's never hit me and I don't believe he ever would. 
even though he's a, a good provider, um, he's a good father, um, you know, never, I never feared for my safety, physical safety. Um, but I learned that dealing with infidelity in a relationship over and over and over again, that infidelity and cheating is abusive too. Absolutely. Because I was experiencing those same emotions. I was feeling helpless. I was feeling, um, I was going through like emotional roller coasters all the time. I was feeling secure. Um, there was times where I wanted to just die. You know, I felt ugly. I felt that I wasn't sexy. Like I started looking at myself in the mirror. Like, why is this man keep doing this to me? Am I not beautiful enough? Am I not sexy enough? Am I not having sex with him enough? Am I this? Am I that? And even though I know in the back of my mind that I wasn't responsible for the cheating, he made those decisions to do the cheating. That doesn't, but it doesn't take away how it affected me. You know what I mean? It made me look at myself. It made me look at myself like, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not. And I've, and I've said this even last week. I said, I asked him, why was I not enough? Even though I know in my head that I'm enough, but I, kept, I asked him and I asked him even last week, why was I not enough? What did I not do right? I felt like I came into this, this relationship healthy and whole and all of that just got broken down. You know, just not trusting my, even my own decisions anymore. Yeah. And it, it, it took a lot out of me. I, I hate to say this, but there's been two times in the last six years where I really thought about ending my life because I was just that hurt and that, um, it's heartbreaking when you, but especially since this was the first man ever, ever, that I felt that I was ready for, the first man ever that I was in love with to the point that um, I had never been before. Like, I've never loved like this before. I've always loved and I've always loved deeply, but because I went into this feeling whole, like I was the woman that I was supposed to be and that I was gonna be a good wife, um, I, fe I fell in love. I fell in love and I, I allowed myself to fall in love because I felt that I was at a place where I was willing to give it back 100%. And it still wasn't enough. And, and even now I, I question myself, like, why wasn't, what did I do wrong? You know? And um, even though I know that I, the forgiving over and over again, I kept saying to myself, what kind of woman have you become? You become the woman that you used to talk shit about. <laughs> mm. and that's true. Mm. I've mm -hmm. had girlfriends who've had husbands and boyfriends and all that kind of stuff that cheated on them over and over again. And they were good fathers. They were good providers. They didn't want for anything. They physically didn't feel threatened. Mm -hmm. But the, their, their spouse just kept cheating over and over again. And they kept taking them back and I'm like what the hell is wrong with you why do you keep taking him back and then I looked in the mirror and one day I just didn't like who I was because I was that woman that I talked shit about yeah yeah I was that woman that I thought I would never be yeah exactly I never thought I would be that, that the woman that I've became these last six years I never thought I would become that woman and I mean I probably even have friends watching right now like yeah uh-huh you got on me when I stayed with mine you talk you talk good crap cash shit to me when I stayed with mine 
-hmm. And I became that woman. And it, it was to the point I, I couldn't even look at myself in the mirror. And I just did not, I fell out of, I fell out of love with myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cause I didn't, I didn't understand. And I still don't understand. Yeah. I still don't understand. And I still ask myself, why, why was I not enough for him to not cheat? And not to, you know, I, and the other thing about it is that me and my husband even explored being a polyamorous couple. And even that wasn't enough. <laughs> so I felt, okay, I'm not enough. We can have a poly relationship and, you know, maybe bring somebody else in see what happens mm -hmm. and there was still somebody else on the side <laughs> it still wasn't enough yeah. so <sighs> from going from a physically and mentally abusive relationship to the, I was pushed down the steps in my my last marriage and it was I had to do restraining orders that was a physically abusive relationship and a mentally abusive relationship being called a bitch every day being called this every day da, 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 to being in a relationship with someone who I, even now I still love him but just he has to have something on the side. And if you know, I, I look at myself and it it hurts. It, it it does, it really does. And um it did. And it does. <laughs> That's all I can say without crying because we ain't gonna start the water work yeah, yeah but i'm sorry i'm so sorry Tiffany. yeah well this is not what this is about it's I about know. you know us sharing our stories and being able to recognize that we were in um abusive relationships whatever form that it was mm -hmm. and i can share all of that other stuff and I've had people get on me about, you shouldn't share what's going on with you right now and be so vocal and so forth about it. And I'm like, well, why, why not? Mm -hmm. Why can't I talk about it? And it That's got to funny. the point that I didn't talk about it. I didn't talk to anybody about it, even though I was going through it and I was feeling the way I was feeling because I was embarrassed yeah. that I kept forgiving and accepting and so forth and so on until I just, the last incident was enough, was enough. Yeah. So, you know, um, I never thought that I would be in that place again where I felt those emotions of just being scared and not knowing who I was and feeling just so, just ugh, <laughs> disgusted mm -hmm. with myself and my life and where it had gone to the point that I just wasn't, I didn't even know who I was anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm learning these last couple of months to try to, to start loving myself again and loving myself through the pain and loving myself through it. And just realizing that, you know, I tried. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I tried. So that's my story. Thanks for sharing. I'm going to sound like we're in therapy. So thanks for sharing. <laughs> but it does take a lot to share your story. And a lot of people are scared because they are, they look, people, they're scared of how people are going to look at them. And they're going to, you know, don't want people to presume that they're weak or whatever. But it's a stronger person to actually tell your story than to hold it in. So I commend you for sharing your story. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> See, I told you I was going to try not to cry. Now I am too, because I'm a cancer. So, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to cry about every day. <laughs> yeah, Even when I don't want to. Yeah. yeah. But crying is healing. That's mm -hmm. true. That is very true. That is very true. Which one mm -hmm. of you ladies like to hear your story? 
um, um, okay, so <clears throat> I dealt with a lot of um, physical and sexual abuse. Um, started as as young as about seven and then um, brutally raped at 17 by somebody I, I knew at gunpoint. Um, <clears throat> it was hard for me to trust men after that. Um, the two important men in my life, which my dad and my daddy and my grandfather, they never put their hands on me. I never even got a pop from my daddy or my grandfather. They never called me out my name. So therefore, for me to attract that, it was kind of different. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> one thing I realized in my relationships after being brutally raped and taking so long to heal, I didn't even have therapy until I was 36. That was the first time I ever even went to therapy. Um, <clears throat> One thing I realized, if I didn't um, heal from my abuser, I would continue to have these relationships. And that's even in my friendship. So I noticed at one point of time, what I would say is, and I will warn people, if you betray me, I don't like who I am when I'm betrayed. You know, and I used to warn people of that because I always said I'm, I'm one to give you the choice. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't understand that I was holding on to, again, my abusers, you know, family members, uh, neighbors, things of that nature. I was holding on to it. So I'm automatically going into friendships, partnerships, feeling like you may betray me. And if you mm -hmm. do, let me explain something to you. There's <laughs> a, a different side to this. Okay. Right. So, um, I took on anger. I took on my abuser's characteristics and it, it came out in anger and rage. So mm -hmm. something that could have been resolved with, a, you know, a conversation, mm -hmm. it was physical for me. Mm -hmm. So because I was abused um, and also even by my, my mother, um, because I have stated before, a lot of times our our first abusers are really our, our parents in some form. And the way my mother used to beat me, um, that's all I do. Physical, you know, that's just it. So I didn't know how to have a conversation. I only knew to fight. And I felt like each and every time I was fighting for my life. So I felt the the person all of my abusers shall I say in some form when I'm fighting you know <laughs> so um even when men was not trying to harm me because they jumped up in my face mm -hmm. I end up hitting first mm -hmm. because my thing is if you come too close or you jump at me I think you're about to attack me mm -hmm. and it, it has it, it was really, really sad. It wasn't until I realized that I didn't let go the abusers for when I was seven. I didn't let go. You get what I'm saying? All these abusers. So this is a, a monster that's being recreated each and every time. And mm. now I have, I'm carrying this anger and, and I didn't know how to, talking was not, no, that's not what we're going to do. Because even at times when I was speaking, it came off verbally abusive mm -hmm. and I had to apologize to even to my children and I had to say you know first of all I was a young teen mom second I wasn't a healed mother so therefore my children developed in a toxic wound mm. and we develop our children in these toxic wounds and we don't understand why they the way because of us we didn't mm -hmm. heal so mm -hmm. I had to apologize to them and I had to really really just pour out my heart to them and um even relationships where I'm, I'm gonna be honest I'm a very transparent person when my ex-husband could have kicked my tail and he should have because I kicked his tail while he was asleep because he cheated mm -hmm. um 
if he would have got up and kicked my butt, he would have been well in his right. Mm-hmm. You know, um, to be honest, he would have. Mm-hmm. Um, he would have been well in his right and he didn't. And one thing I can say, I respect him always for that mm-hmm. um, because I shouldn't have put my hands on him, even though I felt like he violated me and he violated me to a whole nother level of violation. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, I felt like it was justified. However, I was wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, when I went through my healing, after him, one thing being married to him, it showed me how can I expect someone else to be loyal to me when I wasn't even loyal to myself? Mm. And one thing with that, because I knew I shouldn't have married him and I was about to cancel the wedding and I didn't. Second, mm-hmm. I also knew that he triggered me too much. Mm. And when I'm trying to heal, I'm being triggered all of the time. I should, I should have walked away sometimes too many times we trauma bond yeah. and, and, and that's what messes us up to so much. But it, what it taught me is I had a lot of work to do. So after leaving him, I really did the work that I needed to do and I'm still doing the work. Mm-hmm. Um, I really healed from those past uh, relationships, those abusers. Mm -hmm. I had to forgive myself for being an abuser. You know, um, I had to own that. I had to look deep within me, the ugliness within me. If y'all, if I I wish I could tell y'all what's going on right now, but I cannot share nobody else's story. Um, But I came on here regardless for this reason, because it, it, it is important that we heal. And our children are watching us. You know, our children are watching us and it's important that we really heal from our abusers um, so we can release their characteristics. So we can release that anger, that that insecurity. um, So we can really dig deep within and really look at the, uh, I said, you can't ever defeat the enemy or outside until you destroy the enemy within. So until we start doing those things, you know, we really cannot move forward and have healthy relationships because in the back of our mind we're going to start saying will this person hurt me well you know we we setting up for failure we already bringing that energy in oh you want to do something to betray me I had to destroy the word betrayal in my mind Mm -hmm. I really did I had to you know I had to forgive my mother for the abuse that she allowed me to go through I had to forgive my father for the abuse I seen between my parents. I had to forgive um, because my daddy was a great daddy, but he was a horrible husband and vice versa. My mother was a horrible wife. So these are the things we, we saw and they were two unhealed people and all they doing is passing it down. And that's why I said, okay, my grandchildren cannot go through this. This mm-hmm. cannot be their story too, mm-hmm. you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I really felt that when you said that you um, attacked basically your, 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 hus- your husband at the time because he mm-hmm. cheated. Mm-hmm. Um, not only happened- cheated, but let me also say this, and I'm, I'm this transparent, he not only cheated, but he brought me back an STD and I was grateful it was something that was able to be cured. So, yeah. So never going through that, experience as old as I was what well, I'm thinking and you bring me back an STD mm-hmm. oh yeah oh yeah we we about yes yeah <laughs> no, <I'm not. laughs> yeah yeah so <laughs> yeah yeah but again I was still wrong for putting my hands on it yeah I own that. yeah and I I went through that um with my in my marriage that is whatever <laughs> um yeah the last incident that happened, I actually caught him um, and I lost it. Yeah. I lost it. Mm-hmm. I lost it and mm-hmm. physically attacked him. Mm-hmm. Like I hit him every which way that I could mm-hmm. because catching, catching him in that situation and that 
way um, Mm -hmm. after forgiving again the last time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when I forgave the last time, this time was the longest period we had gone without the mm-hmm. teeth. Yeah. And so I had fallen out of love with him before when that happened before, but we had this year that we were doing great. And um, I'm thinking, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm thinking that, um, that we are okay. And mm-hmm. I, actually felt, I actually fell back in love with him. Mm-hmm. So something in me told me that something was not right. And you know, when you get those feelings, you go looking mm-hmm. for stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I did. Mm-hmm. And when I got there to that woman's house and he was there, I already knew that, it, that something was going on, but I pushed anyway. And when he walked out that house, it was on and popping. Yep. But I lost it. Like, I don't even yeah. remember even yeah. going like that. Cause that's not even, I'm not even a physical person. I'm not a physically mm-hmm. confrontational person mm-hmm. at all. Okay. I can tell you, I've never even <laughs> been in a fight before. Oh, wow. Bless your with, heart. Oh, with a woman. <laughs> that, that's all right. With okay. a woman. <laughs> okay now with men that's that's all right just like you with men i whenever you do something wrong to me i i was like you because my dad was very physically abusive to me and so my my normal reactions were from you hurting me or doing something to me was has always been physical yeah but like i said Mm -hmm. When him and I got together, I thought I had gotten past that. And this was before I started as being an advocate, all that kind of stuff. I thought I'd gotten past that. But this last incident with him, I lost it. And I put my hands on him. Yeah. And even though, even though I caught him in that situation, I still should not have put my hands on him. Even though it's understandable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I yeah. still did not yeah. have my hands on him. I should have just walked away. Yeah. Um. But for him then to say to me, "Well, you just abused me." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When he said that to me, or he said, "You just put hands on me, and you're supposed mm-hmm. to be an advocate." That's mm-hmm. what he said. Sorry. Mm-hmm. And I just looked at him like, well, maybe if you weren't where you were supposed to be cheating on me, mm-hmm. then maybe I would have mm-hmm. planned. <laughs> right, right, right. Mm-hmm. And we kept going back and forth. And I was like, you know what? You are right. Mm-hmm. I should not have put my hands on you. And now do you understand why I say we have to help the abusers too? Because, you know, if we don't, and that's one thing I, I can't throw the abuser away because then they go on to abuse someone else. Yes. And that's why we have to help the abusers as well. Because nine times out of 10, the abusers was once a victim of abuse themselves. And it's yeah. just a repeated cycle. Just like I said, even with my son, you know, it's that's all he saw. So that's all he knows. Yeah. Now it's like, now I have to say, no, look, this ain't right. You know, I'm sorry for what you have experienced. I'm sorry for you growing up in a, and developing in a, in a toxic wound, but this is not right. And you cannot do this. You cannot put your hands on people, you know, I, I, I want to kill his father today. I ain't going to even lie. And just like I said, there's certain things I can't say, but I, I have to rise above what I've been taught most of my life to, to do. Yeah. And I have to handle this in a different manner, but I, I get it. I get it. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think if it's not self-defense, I tell anybody, if it's not self-defense, you shouldn't be killing anyone. If it's not self-defense, you should not put, put your hands on anyone. And you, it, it takes a lot of healing to get there, you know, 
because mm -hmm. the old me oh mm -hmm. his father would be dead right now i'm gonna be honest <laughs> and that's just that's just as honest and then and then because i know federal law i would have got away with it as well so um it it but it's i cannot within my spirit my character i have to be the change i want to see and, and and i'm not gonna lie sometimes it's hard Mm -hmm. but I want to be the change I want to see. Yeah, I took a break, um, not only during COVID because it was COVID, but also because I knew that I was in an unhealthy marriage and I did not want to be that person that's out here talking about unhealthy relationships, domestic violence, domestic abuse, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. When I was living in a, a emotionally abusive marriage, it wasn't yeah. right. And so I yeah. couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, but this time I, I said to myself, no, I'm going to share mm -hmm. regardless of the, the clap back that I'm sure I'm going to get, mm -hmm. but I'm going to share because there are so many people out here that don't see that emotion when you are emotionally tearing someone down Mm -hmm. emotionally mentally physically disrespecting someone mm -hmm. when you are mentally just stomped to the ground and you have nothing left mm -hmm. to give or that you that person just has broken you down so much that you want to die yeah that you don't want to <laughs> be here anymore mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. then that is abuse. That is yep. mental and emotional abuse. Mm -hmm. And I, I started talking to different people. So I started doing a research because I plan on writing about what my findings were. So mm -hmm. I had a group of people that were domestic violence survivors, mm -hmm. a second group of people that were domestic violence, I mean, that were that had experienced cheating in the relationships. So they were cheated on, not them cheating on someone, but them being cheated on. Mm -hmm. And then I had a third group who were both domestic violence survivors and had been cheating on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I found that the domestic violence survivors and the people who had been in relationships where they have been cheated on over and over again or once is too much so mm -hmm. ever been cheated on mm -hmm. and I realized and I saw in the questionnaire that I sent them that they were having the same symptoms of low self-esteem helplessness mm -hmm. triggers you know mm -hmm. depression yeah. fearless being fearful they had the same effects. Mm -hmm. It goes and, deep in it. And it's, it's mm -hmm. right. And especially the group, the third group who were both domestic violence survivors and had been cheated on separate relationships. So domestic violence relationship here and someone who wasn't physically abusive to them, but cheated on mm -hmm. them. And they, uh, and they too noticed that the effects and the PTSD and the triggers and all that kind of stuff was the mm -hmm. same. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I, I had heard things before about how, you know, the, the effects of cheating and relationships and marriage and stuff like that. Now, let me tell you, I have cheated on people before. I'm not gonna say that I haven't, mm -hmm. but years ago and I never saw it the way I saw it then that mm -hmm. I unfortunately had to find out now that cheating and infidelity is another form of abuse. Just like rape, when you've been raped, that's sexual abuse, mm -hmm. that's sexual assault. Mm -hmm. And you still have those effects from being a survivor of sexual assault and rape because unfortunately I've been that too mm -hmm. and your your body reacts differently mm -hmm. after that to stimulation and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. um, and so I think 
this one of the reasons why I felt this was important is because people have to understand that just because you don't have a black eye and that's you're not being busted in your mouth that's right down mm -hmm. the steps or whatever that emotional and mental going through tra trauma after trauma and disappointment and hurt and so forth and so on over and over and over again is abusive it is yep. extremely yep. so my story is kind of similar to you ladies i have different aspects of both of y'all combined so mm -hmm. basically my story is i basically kept attracting drug drug addicts okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i grew up in a home on my father's side perfect marriage him and his wife which was not my mother um perfect marriage to me I never saw them fight, never saw them argue, even to this day, like mm -hmm. perfect marriage. My mother's side, not so much, but my mother was the religious, the moral compass in my life. And mm -hmm. so she was the one who I spent majority of my time with. And she was married because of course in religion, they believe that you're supposed to be married and you're not supposed to shack up. And so that was the example that I had in my mother's home. And so with that being said, I always was taught that I was never birthed to be somebody's baby mother, somebody's girlfriend. I was birthed to be a wife. And so from a young age, my mother started to, you know, basically cultivate me into being somebody's wife. I knew by the time that I was 19, I wanted to be a mother. I didn't want to be a mother, but I wanted to be a wife. Um, I ended up with my first person, my first husband. Um, he was somebody I really couldn't stand. He was my uh, my cousin's friend, and he would come by the house every day. We would argue, just like I don't like you. <laughs> but I ended up um, having a situation happen to me, which made me vulnerable. And me going through it, he was the person that was actually there for me. And so we developed a relationship and began to talk. And you know, I was like, okay, he's not so bad. Okay, two years later, I'm married with children with him. I found out six months after. I was married to him that he was addicted to crack cocaine. I never would never ever experience like what they would consider crackheads to be. Um, all I knew is what they would show you on TV and stuff like that. I never knew that there were actually people who smoked crack that could maintain a life because yeah. he worked three jobs, made sure, you know, I was straight. So it was like, to me, I never knew any of that. It wasn't until I was actually pregnant and married to him that I found out that he was smoking crack cocaine. And once again, my religious upbringing said, you don't leave anybody just because, you know, you're going through a hard time. It's for better or for worse. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, here I go. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to leave my husband. I even called my father. I called him and was like, yo, dad, I just found out like this dude smoking crack. Like, you know what I'm saying? And my dad was like, well, what do you want to do about it? And I was like, I don't want to leave him because, you know, all of us have vices, you know what I'm saying, that we have. And I wouldn't want somebody leaving me just because, you know what I'm saying, they feel like I drink too much or, you know what I'm saying, smoke too much or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I don't know what to do. So my father was like, you know, as long as he's trying to get help for it or whatever, you know, you should stick by him. But if he's not, then, you know what I'm saying, you do what you want to do. And so I went to my husband and I was like, yo, what we going to do about the situation? And he was like, I'm going to try to get help. And he did wonderful. Like, you know what I'm saying? Two months. Yeah. Like perfect husband, no problems, none of that. And then he began to get strung out. Like he lost his job. I wasn't at a job back then. This was like in the, um, the early 2000s. I was making about $3,000 a month. And so I was the breadwinner. And we had a newborn baby and like my daughter wore nothing but back then, Nautica, Tommy Hill, figure like mm -hmm. name brand stuff. And so I would go buy her clothes and stuff and all of a sudden clothes start getting missing and, you know, take my car and just get missing with it. Then he had this chick that he was, she was his mistress for the whole eight years that we were married. He introduced her to me as his homegirl. And I'm not the type of chick like my man can't Ooh. have friend girls. Exactly. So like, exactly. you know what I'm saying? I'm like, all right, cool. Me and this chick girl. would go shopping together, like hang out. You know oh, what I'm no. She was married. So I'm you like, you know, I'm, about, I'm ready to fight. <laughs> 
she was married. So I'm like, you know, nah, she, you know what I'm saying? She not messing with my dude or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so here it is. We married. I find out, yes, this is the chick he's been seeing. And this chick was the type, like, she would, if my baby needed pampers, he would call her and be like, yo, my baby need pampers. And the chick would bring pampers. Like, no problem, right? So I was like, oh, well, you know what I'm saying? She want to be stupid and bring my baby this, you know, she want to take care of my family, you know what I'm saying? Whatever, as long as I'm taking care of, I don't care nothing about it. That was the attitude that I had. Plus, I was mm-hmm. raised and my children are supposed to be brought up in a two parent home. So it was like, OK, I'm going to put up with this. But you know what I'm saying? I still got my husband. Mm-hmm. And then he being strung out, he would jump on me while I was pregnant, like, um, I had real long hair that like was longer than this wig I got on (laughs) and it was mine and I would go get it done because my mother was a hairdresser and that was the one thing that satisfied me to keep my hair done and it was the one thing that I could keep for me to look good because like Mm -hmm. he would always like I would put on my clothes and stuff and he would be like who you trying to look good for and you know he would pour water all over my hair if I went and got it done um, he would just like jump in my face and do stuff. And like you were saying, your baby's born in the womb doing traumatic stuff. Mm-hmm. So like my daughter, when she was born, she would hear his voice and he would come around her to go touch her. And she would scream like somebody threw hot water on her. Mm-hmm. She didn't want to have nothing to do with her mm-hmm. father. And so, you know, it got to the point where my daughters, they got older. And at the time they were like two and four and I had been going through like different situations with him. Like I said, he had a mistress the whole eight years we were married. And hmm. so I was doing my daughter hell one day and she looked at me, she was four. She was like, mom, why you keep letting my daddy come to our house? And I was like, what do you mean? She was like, every time he come here, he makes you cry. He takes our hmm. stuff and he makes you cry. And at that moment, it broke me down because I'm like, if a four year old can see this, you know what I'm saying? It's like, Mm -hmm. why is me as a grown woman can't see this? Mm -hmm. It's not that I really couldn't see it. It's just that, like I said, I was taught you're supposed to have a two parent home and for better Mm -hmm. or for worse, this is your husband and you should, you know what I'm saying? Whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm like Mm -hmm. you. um, The day we got married. When I say, oh, God sent the plague, I'm a fucking like, he sent everything to say, no, 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 no. no. You better say that. And I still <laughs> did it. Like, it literally yeah. poured down raining. We argued. We couldn't find a witness. Like, um, it was just so much stuff going on. And God was like, no. And I just, kept saying, <laughs> you know, and then he just looked at me and he was like, are you going to marry me or what? <laughs> and when he said that, I just looked at him crazy. And I was like, you know what? I... So we got married, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. my daughter came to me and she said that to me. And it was like, you know, I got to do something about it. So it was like a couple of days didn't even go by. And he came home and he like was just out of his mind, just going through stuff, just trying to find stuff. to Like, I don't know what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And he he was like, I'll be back. And he left. Mm -hmm. And I left. But when I came back, y'all, he had stole every expensive item that I had in the house. All my designer bags, my jewelry, like mm. everything I had, he stole them. So me being a petty, you know what I'm saying? Gemini cancer that I am. <laughs> Gemini. <laughs> I went and I took all his clothes. He had gators, Timberlands of every color. I went and took one shoe. That part. Of each. I went in and took outfits that didn't match, like, you know what I'm saying, that matched not the shirt or the pants. And I went and put it on my grill. And I put lighter fluid on it and I burned it, okay? Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. The police came and everything, you know what I'm saying? Because they was like, man, you can't be burning, you know, people's stuff out here. But I was like, it's mine. I paid for it. I do what I wanted that to do. That part. You know right. I mean? <laughs> and so, damage like, my own stuff. The next day after all that happened, he had a nerve to try to have an attitude all day. And so he came home high as a kite. And that was the day I was like, you know what? I didn't had enough. I'm not doing this no more with you. And he went to like run at me. And I got in a defense stand with something I never did before. I got in a defense stand and I said, oh, this is what you want to do today? I said, oh, we can go down. I locked the door behind me. I walked around him and locked the back door. I said, today is that day. 
If you ever make it out this motherfucker to tell the story, that's what's going to happen. That's and now today I got the courage to be like, I'm not finna, you know what I'm saying, go through this no more. So I literally, like, ended, he, like when he saw my face and how serious I was, he hauled ass out the front door. <laughs> like he wasn't going to just sit there and fight me like that. Mm-hmm. And I left for like two months and went to Tennessee, moved with my cousin and went to Tennessee. And, you know, I began the healing process of trying to get myself together. Came back, you know, got me. Year later, met another man. Ha! Wonderful God sent. Good man to my children, provider. Like, my parents was even like, yo, when you gonna marry my daughter type stuff? <laughs> like, loved him. You know what I'm saying? My family loved mm-hmm. him. My children loved him. It was just like, okay. And he and I got married, had a great marriage for five years. And then he went to prison. And the reason he went to prison is because he was a hustler and he didn't have a job at the time. So he decided to go back to what he knew and he went and got hustled, you know, hustle and he got popped. He ended up going to prison. Now, before prison, my husband was this caring, loving man who was a great father, great husband. After prison, I don't know what the fuck happened. They sent somebody totally different home. He became this mean and angry drunk. Mm-hmm. From that point on, it was hell and high water. And he just began to like get really, really like angry with me. He wanted to like just jump in my face. And my husband was 6'6. Six, six. And so, you know, somebody that's 6'6 six, six jumping up in your face would try to, but me, I'm 5'11. So we ain't that much indifferent. So he couldn't really right. intimidate me. Plus, at this point, I had that attitude like, you know what? We're not doing this. So you want to fight? Mm-hmm. Let's do this. Mm-hmm. And that's when I was, you know what I'm saying? We would go back and forth. We would do this and that. And I'm talking about go back. And it was like seven years after the fact we got married. I got my first charge of attempted murder. Mm-hmm. And that was the day that I became the abuser. Yeah. I went to jail because my husband flipped out of his mind and decided he wanted to drop kick me to the floor with a ground because I was walking. And I was outside. He dropped, kicked me down to the ground, tried to gash my eyes out, and he tried to choke me. Well, he was choking me. And I just so happened to have a pair of scissors in my hand because I was walking down like our neighborhood was dangerous. And so when I left the situation that day, um, because he wanted to fight, and I was like, I'm not going to fight. So I packed the bag and began to just walk out the house. And so I put some scissors in my pocket for protection, not knowing I would have to use it against my husband. And so he called my name and started running towards me and dropped, kicked me down to the ground and took his thumbs and put them in my eyes and tried to push my eyes out of his socket. He then began to wrap his hands around my neck and choke me. And I'm trying to scream his name, fight him and everything. And he's like, I could see in his eyes, he was gone. He was, gone. He was no longer there. And recently my husband had just been diagnosed with schizophrenia. So mm. not only was I dealing with an alcoholic, I was also dealing with someone who had schizophrenia. Mm. And if you know anything about that mental illness, like their brain tells them scenarios. Mm-hmm. It's not, and they believe it. It's like, mm-hmm. to you, it seems like it's like, uh-uh. But to them, it doesn't matter what you say, what you do. Once their brain tells them this scenario, mm-hmm. they got that in their head and there's nothing you can do about it. Mm-hmm. And so I looked in his eyes and I could tell that he lost it. So I took the scissors out of my hand and I just began to stab. Do you know he didn't flinch? He didn't move. He didn't do nothing. I stabbed him five times and he did not move. It was because my neighbor was riding down the street and saw him on top of somebody and thought that, you know, he needed help fighting or whatever. He gets out the car and realizes it's me he's on top of and he tackles him off of me. The police said that if he had not did that and I'd have kept stabbing, I would have been in going to jail for murder, not attempted murder. I literally spent a week in jail behind defending myself. Oh, okay. Because I was about to say. uh... Yeah, I was just (laughs) about to say that as well. (laughs) I told him exactly exactly what happened, everything. To them, it didn't matter. I messed him up. To them, they saw me as the aggressor. They saw because he had gotten stabbed up, had to go to the hospital. And me, I'm walking around fine. 
I was the aggressor. I had to spend a week in jail, but once I got there and, you know, they heard the circumstances or whatever, by the time I got to the magistrate, I mean, not the magistrate, but to actually see a judge, they dropped it down to, um, I'm sorry, the magistrate, they dropped it down to assault with a deadly weapon with the intent to kill. I mean, to, to inflict bodily injury. And so by the time I got into front of a judge, they dropped it due to self-defense. And right. so from that point on, he knew, he was like, oh, okay, this is what I can do. And she'll get locked up. Y'all, he had me locked up just because he wanted to party on the weekend. He told the police that I hit him, did all kinds of stuff to him just so he could go party for the 4th of July. He had me locked up because I was trying to get my keys from him and accidentally scratched him. I went to jail for that. And while I was in jail, he wrecked, totaled my car while driving drunk. No mm. consequences. Like mm. everything that you possibly can think of that you could do. And he cheated on me like every chance. When I say every chance that he got, every chance brought sexually transmitted diseases home, all that. I forgave him. Why? Because for better or for worse, you know, mm -hmm. you, you put up with stuff and, you know, you hold on to your marriage because that's what you do. You don't get divorced. And, you know, I went through that through hell and high water. I went to jail every year after that until one day my children was like, Ma, you can't do this no more. And I made a vow and a promise to my children that day that I don't care what your father does to me. I don't care what he says to me. I will not spend one more day away from y'all behind him. Mm -hmm. Never. Hadn't been back to jail since. And he literally called the police and lied and told them that I hit him. But my children was the witness. They're old enough now where they witnessed and was like, my mama didn't touch him. Mm -hmm. He also, and this is another thing, ladies. Yes, we can fight them back all day long. Mm -hmm. And when they feel like they can't, that we fight them back, they start to move on to your children because they know your children can't fight back like you do. Mm -hmm. That's something you have to be careful of. And the one thing that made me just say, fuck it and walk away is because my 14 year old at the time he was 12, he was 12 years old. He's squaring up fighting his father, trying to defend his mother. Mm -hmm. And it was like, he shouldn't have to go through that. Absolutely. I'm like you baby girl. Like I had to go to my daughters and tell them like, I'm so sorry. Like mm -hmm. your mother was not a good example of how to be a mother and a woman and, you know, stand her ground. But like I told them, I was taught you was supposed to be in two parent homes. So whatever you had to do to make your marriage or your family work, that's what you do. Not knowing that it was killing my children and killing me also. Mm -hmm. And like you say too, like I literally, we were talking, me and my friends were talking about this today. Matter of fact, like I literally was dying from a broken heart. Yeah. <laughs> like literally so stressed out till mm -hmm. they wanted me to have open heart surgery yeah yeah like mm -hmm. literally like I was sitting there um couldn't walk from my bathroom to my bed without being out of breath mm -hmm. I'm telling him like they want me to have surgery and how he repaid me he stressed me out even more anything mm -hmm. that he could possibly do to stress me out even more mm -hmm. he did mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. People don't realize when they break, when you break up with someone, it's like going through a death. When you're mm -hmm. going through emotional trauma and, you know, all of those things, it's like you're, you're dying because mm -hmm. you literally are so emotionally destroyed and so gone that it starts to take over your body physically. Now, there's a lot of people out here who've never experienced love like that. You know, they move from the next to the next like it's nothing mm -hmm. and don't mm -hmm. want to experience those feelings and emotions. But mm -hmm. it's a part of being human. That's what we're supposed to. You're yeah. supposed to experience hurt, pain, and joy, all of that. Mm -hmm. So when they say you literally die from a broken heart behind oh, yeah. bullshit behind people, mm -hmm. I'm a living witness like you do. Right. I got rid of him. I can mm -hmm. walk three miles today. Mm -hmm. I lost 62 pounds. You know That's what I'm saying? Hard. Like, got That's myself hard. together. Like, no longer mm -hmm. with diabetes, high blood pressure, Yay. none of that. Yay. You know Yay. what I'm saying? My heart feels great. You know what I'm saying? That's, That's because right. I literally got rid of mm -hmm. what was killing me. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that's true. That is yeah. real. That is and real. I, I totally agree with you that you, once, once you are constantly going through that, then, you know, you go, you go through so many emotions when you're in 
those unhealthy relationships, those toxic relationships, those abusive relationships, you go through so many emotions in those relationships that when you get out of those relationships, it's like you're on high alert about everything. You know, mm -hmm. the, those little things some sometimes blow up to be bigger things because you're 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 saying, okay, why is this this is a trigger for me, even when I was single. And that's because it's always that one thing that men that have cheated on me have done is they go outside to talk on the phone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. one thing that has always mm -hmm. been a yes. sign. Mm -hmm. that's and me it still triggers me to this day like totally with every day. man that has cheated that's how I've always caught them and I'm not a chick to go through men's phone like right. I don't go through your pockets I don't go through your phone I don't do none of that but every single time that I figured you cheated I caught you through your phone mm -hmm. yeah and so that's always been a trigger for me and that so even even during that year I told you that we were doing good or at least I thought we were doing good <laughs> And he would go outside on the phone or he would go into another room on the phone. I, it was a trigger, but I, I felt that we were in a good place. And so I didn't react to it, mm -hmm. but you learn those behaviors from those past relationships. And even if they're innocent to you, it's like, okay, something's about to happen. What is about to happen? What's going on? And it might be something mm -hmm. so simple as mm -hmm. whatever it is. It might be something that has nothing to do with another woman or another man, or whatever. It might not have anything to do with it, but there's things that you're gonna, that you take from those past relationships and you bring it into new relationships mm -hmm. because those are your triggers. You you know when he goes outside on that phone and he's spending a little bit of time outside on that phone. What's going on? Who are you talking mm -hmm. to? Um, why you gotta go outside? So you, all the questions start going, mm -hmm. right? So we all have those triggers. I mean, just mm -hmm. even, and like I was saying earlier, after being sexually assaulted, your body responds differently to a lot of things. You mm -hmm. know. Um, mm -hmm. And the same is with domestic violence, no matter whether it's emotional, mental, physical, spiritual, financial, whatever form it is, mm -hmm. you're going to have those triggers. And, you know, as you all three of us can admit, sometimes those triggers resulted in physical fights. Yeah. And, and some of them weren't triggers. It was actual behavior. Like okay. Nicole, yeah. you said that he cheated yeah. on you and he was, and he gave you an STD. Rhonda, you had someone that was abusing drugs and was cheating on you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a lot. It that's, is. that's a lot to deal with. Mm -hmm. And I was, from coming out of a, a, a bad relationship with, you know, bad marriage with the twins dad and getting out of that and um, getting into another relationship. So now that means I've been married a second time, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I tried <laughs> I tried my best to keep my marriage together because I didn't want to be a single mom again. Mm -hmm. That shit was hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. But I realized that my kids are watching this mm -hmm. and they're seeing me crying and depressed and, mm -hmm. and you know, upset and, you know, on, on alert, looking out the window, wondering who he's talking to, questioning him all the time, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I, it's amazing how our children sometimes can be the reason why we say enough is enough. Enough, absolutely. Yeah. And I so appreciate you bringing that part about the womb, um, mm -hmm. Nicoleon, because I was pregnant with the twins when they're, when their father, um, uh, I was with their father while I was pregnant, of course, because we were married. Um, and it got so bad to the point that my parents wouldn't even come and see me mm -hmm. because of what was going on in our, in our house. And mm -hmm. I, to this day, say that I believe that my daughter has ADHD because of all that she listened to. Mm -hmm. And all the stress that I was going through while I was pregnant oh, with absolutely. him. I really absolutely. believe that's the reason. Absolutely. And, 
why she has some of the things because she she deals with mm-hmm. depression too mm-hmm. and my son yeah so you saying that is so true that our children we just don't realize even when we're pregnant oh yeah that what we're going it's through very important that we um heal our wounds before having children mm-hmm. um because yeah they are birthed into that even with when we start getting into um even the cells and the sperm like all that the rage that goes through that's the energy like all that goes through and then you're wondering why your your children have certain characteristics because the seed that was planted in the wound that it developed in yeah the emotions that we go you know people think that the umbilical cord is if you really do a research and i'm talking about even outside of you know what the doctors say that umbilical cord and that connection alone is amazing they're not breathing we're doing all that for them so yeah <laughs> it, it is important it's important um even now i'm so protective over myself now because before i wasn't once mm-hmm. i started doing the healing and I, I would not speak it was times that i wanted to and the ass i'm talking about the divine infinite power was like mm-hmm. you, you have to be quiet you have to go within you need to heal you need to cleanse yourself like literally and I had to deal with the ugliness that was in me. I had to, you know, and each person that, you know, when we say triggers, it, it's still a reflection of us. It's still, mm-hmm. it's still that divine infinite power. If you call it God, whatever you call, still trying to let you see something about you. It's really not about them. Mm-hmm. It's point. really not about them for real. Yeah. You gotta says. look within. You gotta start seeing within. And the moment you do that, you will attract different things. And it will not be no int- attraction on anything that that reminds not- you of some type of trauma. Yeah. You're like, not bonding suffer- off of that anymore. I suffer <laughs> from PTSD based upon like I was like you, but I wasn't like I'm a fight. But I will mm-hmm. warn guys, like when I started back dating, um, after my husband's. I would warn guys, like, look, don't get too close to me or back me into a corner because I might feel like I have to defend myself. Mm-hmm. Like, it's nothing that you mm-hmm. may have done personally to me, mm-hmm. but I just mm-hmm. need to get, you know what I'm saying, triggered. Mm-hmm. Like, if I feel like you're too close to me or you get into mm-hmm. loud with me or whatever, mm-hmm. I was like, bro, I'm not responsible mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. And guys would be like, I quit playing, you know what I'm saying? And, we'll mm-hmm. stuff, and then I fuck, you know, and still off on, they be like, what the fuck yeah. you doing? I just told mm-hmm. you, like, don't I play with you. <laughs> like, yeah, That's don't right. play with me like that. And it's like, <laughs> because I've been through, and I had to tell them, like, I've been through so much stuff with dudes and stuff. Like, you don't get it. You, you really mm-hmm. don't get it. Like, don't don't touch mm-hmm. me if I say don't touch me. That's like, right. I had this big thing about being touched in my sleep. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, you touch me. If, if I tell dude in a minute, if you're going to get some, you better get it before I go to sleep or, you know, when I wake up. <laughs> no, and it's just because, like, I'm not trying to be funny. I, but, no, like, I, understand. I, been, I understand that completely. I've been mm-hmm. through, like, my husband would, like, literally cheat on me or he would hit me or do some bullshit and then literally take my coochie like because i'm like nah mm-hmm. nigga, like i'm not attracted to you right now i'm not i'm, I'm not in the mm-hmm. mood to have sex and he would literally take it or you know what i'm saying like i'm sleep and he would you know do stuff to me mm-hmm. so like yes i'm triggered by stuff like that you know what i'm saying like mm-hmm. i can't deal with you touching on me you know what i'm saying in the middle of the night because i don't know what i might do now I, right. you know what i'm saying i would love to be able for my man to touch me or you know what i'm saying if i had one but anyway another story <laughs> but you know i would love you know what i'm saying for my people to like hold me in the middle of the night and you know get it in you know slide it in whatever but <laughs> yeah. i'm one of them chicks like you can't do that with me you know what i'm saying yeah. you liable to get beat up and you know what i'm saying in the middle of the night mm-hmm. trying to be affectionate mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah but that's it just comes from certain so, you know what, what, so what do you do to heal from that if that's the case Okay, what so are you doing what, for that? What I'm doing is mm-hmm. I'm recognizing it. That's and right. so like with my last partner, I explained this to him, mm-hmm. but I would still allow him to touch me. I just mm-hmm. told him, if you're going to do it, just do it. Don't rub on me, mm-hmm. you know, like, you know, stuff like that, because that's what's going to trigger it. Like, just mm-hmm. go for what you know. So I'm mm-hmm. learning to like, elite, that's the first step for me. 
no, allowing you just to up. touch me, period. That's what's up. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm that's saying? Right. So it's like it's baby steps. And then yeah, like with, um when Tiff was saying like she felt like she wasn't enough. So I'm gonna tell you this, Tiffany. Um, you're more than enough. Okay. Right. Because you're more than enough for yourself. You don't need anybody else to validate you, complete you, or anything. And I'm speaking to myself when I say this as well. And it's just because like I was doing the same thing because the dudes who like my husband, my first husband, he cheated on me with chicks, you know what I'm saying? That was light skin and short. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not me. My second Mm -hmm. husband, he cheated on me with girls who were at least my color, but they were little skinny chicks. Mm -hmm. My recent dude, he wanted to cheat on me with light skin, a little short chicks, you know what I'm saying? It looked nothing like me so each time I kept saying why they keep choosing these other women that don't look nothing like me like you know you chose me to be your wife you know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying so like why you didn't choose what you really wanted like that's what you're attracted to that's what you want Mm -hmm. why you didn't go for that but you got me over here feeling crazy about myself Mm -hmm. like you know what I'm saying I had this man leave me because I was too big I had this man leave me because I was too small like Mm -hmm. And it made me like question myself and I had to literally get in the mirror and I do it every day. Like you're beautiful. Mm -hmm. You're more than enough. Just because Mm -hmm. these crazy fools didn't know how to love you doesn't mean that Mm -hmm. you're not lovable. You know what I'm saying? Because they didn't see the beautiful queen that you are doesn't mean that Mm -hmm. you aren't. And Mm -hmm. I'm, I guess I'm crazy because I still Mm -hmm. trust people. Like I'm still a hopeless romantic. I feel like my partner is out there for me somewhere. Like, I don't look at people get into relationships or meet people, you know what I'm saying, automatically going into it with like, oh, they're going to do me dirty. I don't Mm -hmm. do that because if I did, I'll never find my person. You know what I'm saying? And I just look at it like Mm -hmm. these fools didn't know how to love me properly. Mm -hmm. These fools Mm -hmm. didn't recognize the beautiful person that I am. Somebody's Mm going to come along and going to say, hey, she has a great heart. She's a beautiful person inside and out. Mm-hmm. And they're going to appreciate it. And they're going to, you know what I'm saying, want that and appreciate it. And they're not going to make me feel bad about being who I am. That's right. So you're more That's than right. enough. Any woman out there listening, you're mm-hmm. more than enough because you're mm-hmm. enough for yourself. Right. And that's mm-hmm. the only person that you have to love and have to please is you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I know my, my situation was a little different. I used to think being beautiful, my beauty was a curse. So I tried to do everything to alter. Like I, I put on weight on purpose, especially after I was brutally raped. I felt like if I wasn't pretty, like the streets called me cola because of my shape. And so I felt like if I wasn't pretty, these things wouldn't have never happened to me. So I, I put on a bunch of weight put on a bunch of weight and um at my heaviest I was almost 300 pounds but I'm tall too I'm five ten and a half well I like to say five eleven but you know <laughs> I'm always trying to say five ten so mm-hmm. anyway I just I love being tall but um you know so th- I will put on weight and things of that nature and every time I notice I would drop weight in my mind even when, even in my heel process, in my mind, I will automatically like, oh, if I start getting compliments, I'll start eating or something. And I had to check myself. Like I, people didn't know for a long time, I used to cringe when men would give me compliments I, or I, I would try to take it off of me. <laughs> if somebody give me a compliment, oh, I'd be like, oh no, you're beautiful. I'd rather put it on you. You get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I couldn't receive it for myself because I felt like it was always attached to some type of trauma. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. So when, when finally I had to say, okay, you have to get healthy now. It's about you being healthy. It's okay to lose weight. It's okay. You know, it's okay to be beautiful, Nicole. It's okay. And nobody's going to harm you, you know, um, and, and that's, that was by my, my last thing to myself, I said, okay, do I want to, how do I want to lose this weight? Do I want to do surgery? Do I want to do this or whatever? I said, no, I'm going to drop my weight first. And then I do want to have my mommy make over mm-hmm. afterwards. Um, and I feel like that would be my last thing for me, you know, um, just, you know, turning a you know like reversing the abuse I did to myself because of what others did to me you get what I'm saying so I started to abuse myself so that's my 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 last part for me you know Nicole no it's okay you can go ahead and 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 correct the things you have done wrong to abuse your own body and it's okay 
And, and that's what it is it's really about, um, us healing for real and, and helping others to heal, you yes. know, um, and, and healing is not easy and it's very painful because it goes back to looking at self. You know, why did you attract this person? Why did you want this person so much? And the more I started to look at how I was more loyal to other people than myself, how can you allow someone Mm. else to, how can you be more loyal to someone else than you are to yourself? And that's when I had to say, right then and there, I had to be honest with the fact of that came from my mother. I was going to say, you didn't, you don't know what, the reason why we do that, people wonder why we hold on to abusive situations and toxic mm-hmm. situations is li- is literally because it's programmed in you mm-hmm. and you don't realize, like I tell, like, okay, so I used to be a mental health and substance abuse counselor for 10 years, no longer that, ha, hallelujah. But anyway, <laughs> um, I used to tell my clients like all the time, like it's like a tape recorder. It took somebody X amount of years to make you feel this particular way. It doesn't happen overnight that you don't feel this particular way. You know what I'm saying? You have to just like, even though I've lost 60 something pounds, when I look Mm. in the mirror, I still see the fat girl. I Mm. never see the person that everybody else sees, even though logically, Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. I know I've lost 62 pounds. I see the numbers yeah. every time I get on the scale. I see yeah, it every time I put on my clothes. That. Mm-hmm. But it's, it goes back to, like, you know what I'm saying? My husband would tell me how fat and ugly I was. Nobody mm-hmm. was ever going to want me. And then it's like, mm-hmm. okay, well, I lost the weight. Now what? Mm-hmm. Okay, now this one don't want me because I lost too much weight. And then, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? It's like I go back and forth, but I always see this fat girl. And he was like, he would, like, literally laugh when I will put on lingerie, Mm. you know how mentally disturbing that is for you as a woman to put on lingerie, trying to be sexy for your husband. And you walk out the room and this nigga belly over is laughing. Like he didn't seem the most hilarious thing of the century. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Like it was, no, I'm good now. Cause you know, now at this point, I know (laughs) I'm a bad bitch. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) So, (laughs) I don't worry about that no more. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm Gucci with me. And like I said, even though I see the fat girl, mm-hmm. it's cool. Like she here, she's still beautiful. Mm-hmm. You know what That's I'm saying? Right. It doesn't That's matter. Right. I was beautiful at 2 with 52 and I'm beautiful at 176. So yes, yes you right. are. That's yes, right. you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> yes, and that's what you have to do. You have to remind yourself like every day constantly. I'm beautiful. Mm-hmm. I'm who I am. Not what somebody says I am, but I am who I say I am. And we often forget that. That's and right. Tiffany will tell you, like, I'm saying this now because I'm back to me. But, mm-hmm. like, around Christmas time, I literally was going to check myself into mental health and I felt like killing myself. Like, I really did. And I reached out to a lot of people, you know, who swore they were my friends and loved me and this and that and the other. And nobody responded. Nobody tried to get in contact with me. But, you know what I'm saying, a small group of people. Small mm-hmm. group of people. But I literally wanted to take my life just because I was feeling worthless, feeling like nobody loved me and none of that. But something snapped at me in the first of the year and was like, right. it's you stupid. Mm-hmm. Like, no, we're not doing that. You mm-hmm. are, you know what I'm saying? You are her. Right. Get back to you before That's you became right. a mother, before you became mm-hmm. a wife. Absolutely. Any all that of part. That. that part. And and that's what I do. I, I love on myself now. I take myself out. I, um, I do a lot of things with myself, like, um, is, I I have to, you know, um, I'm surrounding myself with people who is honest enough to say, you know what, we all are in this together for real, and there's no competition, Um, I'm not trying to outdo you, I want to see you win, and I, I surround myself with those people, um, I, I would not accept anything less than I deserve today. And I'm so grateful that I'm that way because it was a long time that I, I, I wasn't that way with myself. Um, I won't even allow my children, who are, they are all adults, um, but I would not even allow my children to disturb my peace today. You know, um, I'm, I'm careful with me now. I'm gentle with me now. 
um, I'm, I'm learning to, to really enjoy who I am. Um, and, and, and it wasn't, I laugh a lot, you know, I laugh a lot now because it was a time that I, I, I didn't laugh. Okay. So I laugh a lot now. Um, I'm, I'm learning to enjoy living, you know, I'm learning that now. I want to allow my grandchildren, I want my grandchildren to experience living and not just existing. One thing my children told me in one of our conversations, they said, Ma, you always taught us how to survive, but you never taught us how to live. And I had to say to them, well, I couldn't teach you something I didn't know. I I didn't know how to live. All I knew was to survive. So now I'm learning how to live, you know? So, um, yeah, um, I, I really, really thank you for your, your, you know, transparency. I really do. It's, it's really encouraging. I, um, and then I just, I can't wait to really just, you know, um, go to God in prayer on y'all behalf as well, you know, because that's what sisterhood is about. You know, I feel like these men will get, get it together the moment we get it together, you know, for real, for real, you know, um, um, one thing I'm also saying, we were raising someone's dream or somebody's nightmare. Yep. So we have to be good. You know, yeah, everybody we, keeps yeah. saying it's a man's world, but we see uh -oh. when men it's, run in the world with it, what you see. It's, it's, and, and yeah, we, we have to do it for each other and, and push each other through and please at any time, hold me accountable. You know, yeah. if I'm in error, please hold me accountable. You know, because that's what I feel like true love is when we hold each other accountable and say, Queen, you got to rise above that. You know, um, there's other people that need you. You know, I need you. You know, I need you, Tiffany. I need you, um, Ro. And yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be um, in y'all's presence. And I thank you. Thank you. And everybody has a story and mm -hmm. just for all the women out there who have been in the situation as us are going through that situation. Yeah. Um, just know you're not alone. Like I literally, I tell people all the time, I literally had to go to jail mm -hmm. in order for me to reach one person. That part. There was somebody who was assigned to me when I was there. Every time I've been to jail and I've been four times. Every mm -hmm. time I've been to jail, there was somebody who was assigned to me there. And I never stayed in jail or never actually been convicted of any charge. And every time I've been to jail, it was behind my husband. I've never mm -hmm. been to jail for anything else in my life. Mm -hmm. And I caught my first charge at 36. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. But every time I went, I went there to minister to somebody else, to tell another young lady my story. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Like, I'm about to put out a book. I'm working on it. And awesome. but every time I do, I start working on it. It breaks mm -hmm. me down because it brings up so much stuff that I thought, but you know what I'm saying? Part. I was over yeah. or I forgot mm -hmm. about or, you know, whatever. So it brings me back to another point mm -hmm. where I'm having to slow down and get myself together. Mm -hmm. But God told me it's your time. It's time for you to tell your story. Like. That's Before right. it was like stuff, I was like, uh uh, I'm not telling nobody that. Like, I'm taking that to my grave. Like, I ain't mm -hmm. telling nobody. But I was like, nope, right. I sent you through that because you needed to tell somebody else that. That's you don't right. go through the things like we don't realize in life that we don't go through the things we go through for us. We mm -hmm. go through them for somebody else because there are people out here who don't have somebody in their corner that mm -hmm. tell, you know what I'm saying, to tell them all the beautiful things that we tell each other. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like these podcasts we do. Somebody may just be listening right now, just seeing, you know, beautiful women on a podcast. Like, what are they talking about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because of that, you know what I'm saying? That person, we reach that one person. Mm -hmm. It may not be a lot of people viewing. It may not be a lot of people listening. But if our stories can help one person, one person. that one That's person can help That's one right. person. And that part. Exactly. That's real. I want to thank you all for coming on and sharing your stories. Um, I think that it takes a lot for you to one, share your story about being um, a victim or a survivor of rape, um, a survivor of domestic violence, a survivor of you know, physical, emotional, mental abuse, all of that. But I think it, it says a lot when you're able to admit 
that you had a moment where you were abusive too. Yeah. And um, even though, even though in that, when you love someone and you have forgiven them over and over again, and you all know this, you're on uh, row, you stress this as well you you forgave multiple times and Nicole and you didn't you didn't murder anybody um <laughs> that you probably would have back in the day mm-hmm. um, and that but these things come from a place of pain and a place of hurt but oh, yes even though I caught him cheating even though you caught him and found out that he was um, a sub, you know, a substance user, and that he had cheated on you. Even though you found out that he cheated on you, and so forth and so on, that did not give me the right to hit him. That didn't give you the right to hit him. That didn't give you the right to hit him. Um, even though people will say, "Well, girl, I would have done the same thing. I would have did this, and I would have done that." Mm-hmm. When you are in a position like we are to share our past stories Mm -hmm. of victory and Mm -hmm. of overcoming. And I had that, those eight years of me working on myself and thinking that I'm, I'm, I'm at a good place to be an advocate, to help other women. And I still am Mm -hmm. in the position to be able to do that. Even though Mm -hmm. I had that moment that I freaking lost it. And I will say I lost it. Mm -hmm. You're human. Right, you're, you're, you're human, and for him to use that against you in a moment that he did something fucked up, that that's just being narcissistic. Like you're human, and I literally got off on that charge, y'all, for this because of something like this. Oh, I, I didn't tell y'all. I didn't I tell y'all what? what I didn't. I didn't tell y'all that he pressed charges against me. It's okay. It's okay. So, and but when I when we went to court, I had I sent the the judge a letter before I went. My lawyer helped me with it. And he said, I, and my, the, my lawyer told me, and I looked at the court papers, there was nothing in there about the fact that I caught you over this woman's house and that you were Gino. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There was nothing in the papers about that. There was nothing in the charges. Mm-hmm. And so I sent the letter to the judge and I let them know that that is not the type of person that I am. I'm not a fighter. I don't go around mm-hmm. fighting people. Mm-hmm. I said, but I've forgiven this man over and over and over again and to catch him again Mm -hmm. after I just fell back in love with him. Mm -hmm. I -hmm. said, Mm -hmm. I lost it. Mm -hmm. And if that makes me guilty of, you know, what I did, then I'll, then I'll accept it. I said, that's exactly how I got off on my charges. I'll accept it. (laughs) Not mm-hmm, easy, mm-hmm. and yeah. I, it wasn't. It wasn't just I saw his car over there. I actually caught them and heard them. So mm-hmm. when he, when that door opened, I went off. Yeah, and I said, and I, and I said, I'm, I'm from looking at the court papers. I know that he did not say any of that when he came and pressed charges for me. Yeah, mm-hmm. and the lawyer, I told the judge, same thing. I said, if you walked in the room and saw your husband, I mean your wife. And your best friend doing such and such and such, you could say right here in this courtroom what you would do all day long. Mm -hmm. But when you put in that situation, situation, you don't know what you're gonna do. You could be trained Mm -hmm. and namaste and all of that stuff. (laughs) That part. You are a human being with feelings and Mm -hmm. emotions. And we can say what we will do right here, what we're supposed to do. But in that moment, Mm -hmm. you do what you do. And like I told him, if Mm -hmm. I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't change Mm -hmm. nothing about Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. He said dismissed. Yes. And the mm-hmm. and the judge, the judge literally did laugh when when he's he 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 dropped the charges. But the, the judge looked at him and was like, You should be ashamed of yourself for even yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. Even though the charges were dropped, I I that that whole situation that happened this last time was like enough is enough I cannot continue to do this self to do this to myself and Mm -hmm. I continue to take myself through this because Mm -hmm. because 
I, I have dedicated my life to helping my community and helping other women. Mm-hmm. I am mm-hmm. not going to be the woman that people are going to look at and say, well, I can't listen to nothing she says. She mm-hmm. can't do nothing for me. Mm-hmm. Because she did it. She, 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 you became abusive too. I don't mm-hmm. ever want that to follow me. Yeah. So I really, uh, I, it takes a lot for y'all to share that part of you and that situation and being able to admit to yourself that you still have some work to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And my work, unfortunately, had to start all over, but I'm I'm with it and I know that I can get through it. So that's right. I thank you. Y'all have y'all are in inspiring to me because even though I'm in it right now and I'm back to trying to heal from everything right now, I yeah. know that I'm gonna get back to that place. And I'm a, I'm a hopeless romantic too. So I'm not saying yeah. that I ain't never yeah. gonna fall in love again. I ain't gonna say that. That's but right. I will say that I will not allow another person to mm-hmm. take it. I love, I will not. Absolutely. Yeah. And then I think also it helps you to stop ignoring the signs yes yeah yeah it does Mm -hmm. it does it does so thank you ladies i appreciate you you. um i can't wait to see y'all on sunday i know (laughs) same yes i can't wait to hug you (laughs) the alter ego project ladies if y'all are listening the alter ego project we are doing a women empowerment fashion show um in charlotte in april um and we are about to do our model call on February 7th, looking for women, business owners, professional women who are not afraid to strut their stuff. And they know that they are all that. And you are also a professional woman. We wanna see all sides of you. We wanna see that professional side. We wanna see the sexy side. We wanna see that fierce side. And we want you to do it with no apologies. Be who you are, be true to yourself. Be authentic to you. And it's okay to show all of you. You don't have to hide who you are to, to anybody. And that's, that's what the right. Alter Ego Project is about. So um, we're doing our, our photo shoot on Sunday. And if you are interested in joining us or wanting to be a model for our fashion show, or you just want to come and hang out with some dope women, come out February 7th and uh, for the model call at 4800 uh, Lounge off Monroe Road. So thank you, ladies. Thank you, Miss Nicoleon. Thank you, thank you um, thank Roki. You. Please tell everybody how to find your business, um, Nicoleon, your businesses. Yes, um, Nicoleon um, Jackson, or you can put Nicole Jackson at um, humanitywithoutcolors.com is my email address. Oh. Um, then I have Nicoleon Jackson for Facebook, Nicolian number one. They took my other page down, but it's okay. Nicolian <laughs> number one on IG. <laughs> it was um, cutting up when you're cutting. That's why they cut yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> two, two was honest, like she, I guess. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Nicolian number yeah. one um, and Nicolian Jackson on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Ro, tell everybody how they can find you. So you can reach me on Ropey Hill on Facebook. I'm also Ropey Hill, period, 621 <laughs> on Instagram. You can hit me up on it. Yeah, period, boo. And you, you can hit me up on those to find anything um that you need to find out about my company and um i just want to say shout outs to my brother willie face promotions you know what i'm saying who always <laughs> like while i'm sitting here he over here in the corner working promoting and you know what i'm saying putting stuff on yeah, I, I, see I see him i see him shout out to bro you know what i'm saying for always looking out for me with the promotion and if you need promotions i'll let him willie face Absolutely. monster production Promotion, excuse me, on Instagram. Yes, yes. yes. I've been talking to him about promoting me. So yeah, y'all, y'all make sure y'all reach out because he, he, yes. he be doing a thing. He be doing a thing. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, ladies. Yeah. Thank you. We we went over Thank half. You. You know what we got something done. We got something accomplished, and That's hopefully right. we help somebody. So <laughs> have a good yeah. night, ladies. I'll see y'all good soon. Night. All right. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye.